on this Friday night. The E. coli outbreak grows as investigators close in on where the contaminated greens came from. As some ask, is it time to rethink romaine? I don't want any uh, any delays, you know, to hurt my hit my presence. The Canada Post strike looms over Black Friday as Ottawa moves to force workers back on the job. What it means for your holiday shopping. And as Rocky returns for another round. Our pop panel weighs in on how to do a reboot right and the holiday movies we love to hate. Happy Friday, this is The National. Food safety officials are getting closer to the source of that E. coli outbreak that's led to romaine lettuce being pulled from store shelves and sent people to hospital in Canada and the United States. At least 54 people are believed to have fallen ill from the tainted greens, 32 are in the U.S., and today health officials announced three new cases in Canada, bringing the tally here to 22. Eight people wound up in hospital, one with kidney failure, and today the U.S. Food and Drug Administration said California is likely the source of the problem, though no specific supplier has been identified. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency said it can't yet confirm whether California produce is the culprit in this country. The CBC's Olivia Stefanovic looks at why romaine is a risk. Fresh dinners continue to be served at this busy salad bar. Only a key ingredient is missing. Romaine lettuce pulled from the menu out of an abundance of caution. You're scared because maybe when you heard the news, somebody already take it. It's this dangerous. The problem is romaine can still be sold because Health Canada has issued a warning, not a recall. Uh, certainly they didn't do a very good job by just giving us a, a health advisory not to eat uh, romaine because what that does is put doubt in people's minds. Canadian officials are still trying to determine the source. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency has tested more than 2,000 samples of fresh lettuce and packaged salads but found no sign of the bacteria. Still, that doesn't mean it's not lurking in the food system. Romaine has a shelf life of about four to five weeks, lots of time for bacteria to grow. That's why the agency is advising that you throw it all away. This is the second Canadian E. coli outbreak in the past two years, linked to the same dark green leaves that has put businesses on edge about E. coli. I don't want this romaine to come to my store. When I order romaine, I don't want to find it. Romaine can be susceptible to contamination for a few reasons, says one expert. When it's big, the bacteria can grow and persist for a long time. I would uh, imagine with romaine lettuce, it's all down to a contribution of delicate, uh, delicate tissue, the growth of E. coli, and the fact we don't uh, cook it and eat it raw. Washing doesn't help. He says the best thing customers can do is use caution replace romaine leaves with, say, iceberg. It may not make the same Caesar salad, but at least he says it can buy confidence. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Toronto. We tend to think of lettuce as healthy, a good thing to eat, but a prominent food journalist says the romaine warning is a good opportunity to rethink lettuce altogether, arguing it's wasteful, risky, and a nutritional lightweight. We're talking about lettuce, we're talking about the lettuce that you're buying in the store. And there are a couple of reasons you might want to consider switching to cooked vegetables. The first is that lettuce is relatively resource intensive because lettuce is like 96% water. So if you take a head of iceberg lettuce and you take a bottle of Avion, they're basically the same percentage water. You're shipping refrigerated water across the country. But the second is that because lettuce is something you eat raw, uh, it can be a vector for foodborne illness, which we've seen with the romaine outbreak and, and E. coli. But, you know, I want to be clear, I'm not banning salad. It's maybe that we should start thinking 
about it more as a luxury food rather than as a vegetable staple. People are very attached to salad. It always feels personal when somebody disses your favorite food, whatever that happens to be. If you want to look farther afield, check out sweet potatoes. They're my personal favorite when it comes to sort of feeding the world responsibly because they're incredibly nutritious. You can grow a whole bunch of them on a small piece of land and they don't have to be shipped refrigerated. They're a great win for the climate and also for the dinner table. Well, let's move on to Black Friday now, and shoppers have been filling malls and stores right across this country, fueled this year by bargains, of course, but also by concerns over those rotating strikes by postal workers. That strike, though, could end as early as Monday, but not without a fight, protests on the street, and perhaps a confrontation in the courts. Tom Perry tells us why. As Canada Post workers hit the picket line in Ottawa, their job action was a burning issue not far away on Parliament Hill. MPs began debating back-to-work legislation to put an end to five weeks of rotating strikes. We have worked very hard with both parties to help them reach a, a, an agreement. However, having said that, we are now at a time where we have to take action. Let's the government the says Canadian businesses need Canada Post back up and running, delivering parcels for online shoppers as the holidays get closer. My question to the minister is why did they not act sooner? They knew this crisis was coming. Why did they While conservatives the accuse the Liberals of foot dragging, the most direct attacks on the government's back-to-work legislation came from the NDP. Today we're here for these people you see around me, these working people. Jagmeet Singh joined today by Canada Post employees outside the Commons, accusing Justin Trudeau's Liberals of trampling workers' rights. He's bringing a sledgehammer to deal with negotiations. By doing so, he's undermined negotiations. I don't understand what part of Canadians have the right to free and fair collective bargaining this Prime Minister doesn't understand. The union representing Canada Post workers was also back on the offensive, protesting at Liberal MPs' offices across the country while its leadership made a last-minute plea to the government to rethink its legislation. You don't have to violate workers' rights. You don't have to rip up the right to collective bargaining. The government has options. From Labour as well, a warning of possible legal action. Should the government pass the law, we will be back in the courts and we'll, we'll get a ruling from the courts where again, whether this government has violated the most fundamental tenet of our constitution, the right of workers to, of course, to have the right to strike in this country. The government insists it's still hoping for a negotiated settlement to the Canada Post dispute, but it's fast-tracking its legislation and hopes to get it through the House of Commons tonight. The Senate is prepared to sit through the weekend with royal assent coming soon after that. If it all goes according to the government's plan, the rotating strikes at Canada Post could end within a matter of days. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. As Tom mentioned, the strike is worrying some consumers ahead of the busy holiday season. Many were out hunting for Black Friday deals today. I'm afraid I cannot get my product in time so that I will come to the physical shop. The uncertainty on when or whether online purchases would arrive pushed many Canadians offline and into the crowds. I don't feel like anything's going to come on time. I don't want any odd. Uh, any delays, you know, to hurt my, hit my presence. Online or in store, Canadians apparently were planning to spend more money on Black Friday than ever before. According to a recent survey, 40% of Canadians said they were going to shop today, compared to 25% on Boxing Day. Of course, the Black Friday shopping tradition is American-born, and bargain hunters there push their way through crowds for the best deal. Now in Alabama, that led to a deadly confrontation and shooting. For most people, of course, Black Friday not marked by violence, though, just long lines and some great deals. These things are very expensive, okay? And this is, this is, this is a bargain, and we're going to take this bargain and run with it, okay? And for those who didn't find what they were looking for, well, there is always Cyber Monday. But the environmental cost of all this shopping can be steep. Too many truckfuls or carloads of packaging and fast fashion. It's not always clear whether it's greener to shop online or at the mall. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, breaking some bad consumer habits can make a difference. Panoramic. Awesome. <laughs> New colors and cuts. 
all made in Canada. Toronto-based Mick Clothing is all about local sources. From thread to hanger, I can see the whole process. And being conscious of its carbon Perfect. footprint. This is our Emily Blazer, um, made out of bamboo. As an online retailer, it also tries to limit the environmental impact of its shipments. Mick doesn't offer express shipping or free returns. Do you really need it in two days? Can we do the standard shipping that allows the trucks to be full? Online shopping can be better for the environment, largely because of transportation issues. Shoppers don't drive to the mall. Instead, one truck delivers many purchases. But choosing rush delivery can make it worse. When I'm making this demand for a quick delivery, what happens is the truck can't wait for another product to be added to that shipment, and so it needs to go right away. So this is generating a trip by truck. Delivery trucks stuck in traffic, consumers who order multiple sizes planning to ship items back, and failed delivery attempts all add to pollution. This is the place where we receive all the online orders. Companies like Penguin Pickup want to be part of the solution. A small storefront acts as a delivery hub where online shoppers can pick up their packages. The truck is only going to our location instead of 50 locations. Amazon and others are trying out delivery lockers. UPS is piloting cargo bikes. And retailers themselves could help change the way we buy. Online retailers could offer a price incentive for behaving in a different way. So maybe if you can wait to have that t-shirt for another few days, you can get a couple of dollars back. Mick believes its shipping policies may turn some customers off. We would rather have fewer customers doing the right thing than more customers doing the wrong thing. It's a trade-off some companies like Mick are willing to make. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Some other stories we're following tonight on The National. We are getting more details about the resignation of a Liberal MP. The Prime Minister's office confirming Raj Graywall is getting help for a gambling problem. Yesterday he announced he was stepping down immediately due to personal and medical reasons. When asked, the Prime Minister's office said they weren't aware of any local police investigation into Graywall. But earlier this year, the RCMP did make inquiries into a complaint to the Ethics Commissioner such a, a dangerous thing to have in your system, knowing how the other two were, or how badly they'd been affected by it, I was, I was petrified. For the first time, we're hearing from the police officer poisoned by Novichok, that is the deadly nerve agent that landed former Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter in hospital for months. Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey was the first officer to enter their house back in March and got contaminated through his forensic suit. The UK government blames Russia for the attack. Two people have been charged. They are reportedly Russian intelligence. And today, police released new video of two other men that they are also looking for. And there was a surprising Friday afternoon announcement from Queen's Park. The Ontario government is backing away from some of its cuts to francophone services amid uproar from the Franco-Ontarian community. Premier Doug Ford announcing that he's reinstating the French Language Services Commissioner. Ford will also turn the Office of Francophone Affairs into a full ministry with Caroline Mulroney taking over that portfolio. And Catherine Cullen joins us from our Parliamentary Bureau with the late developing details. Let's start, Catherine, with the significance of this. Yeah, well, it's significant in a few ways, Ian. Certainly to the more than 600,000 Franco-Ontarians who were mobilizing to stop these changes. To be clear, they didn't get everything they wanted. For example, Ford isn't reviving plans to build a Francophone university, but it is still a surprising change of approach. It's also significant because... This is unusual for Doug Ford. Of all the words you might use to describe him, flexible is probably not the first one that comes to mind. So for him to change his tune is noteworthy. And I think it's quite significant for Caroline Mulrooney. She was really in a tough spot having to defend this. Now not only does her job get a bit easier, the news release today refers to her as Ford's all-star minister, leaving the impression that maybe she had a hand in changing Ford's mind. And one of the reasons we're covering this is this is, has repercussions beyond Queen's Park, especially for Conservatives. Well, 
If this move seriously calms the concerns around this issue, Andrew Scheer will certainly be breathing a sigh of relief. He has been courting Quebecers, and Ford's move was not going over well in Quebec. There was a real fear among Conservatives that Scheer was being hurt by this, too, that he wasn't being seen as a strong enough defender of Francophone rights. For the federal Liberals, well, they were certainly trying to add to Andrew Scheer's misery, actively blaming him for Ford's actions. This takes a lot of wind out of their sails, and in fact, now it's actually the Liberals who are being blamed by Ford's government. Caroline Mulroney put out a statement saying Francophones in Ontario get less funding per capita than in other provinces from the federal government. Oh, and by the way, Ian, the Prime Minister, is meeting with Doug Ford and the other Premiers just two weeks from today. All right. Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. The Calgary Stampeders and the Ottawa Red Blacks are getting ready for the big game this Sunday, vying for the 106th Grey Cup in Edmonton. But there was another issue on the minds of plenty of people in the CFL world today, the possibility of a new team. We're having this amazing conversation about the future uh, of the CFL with a 10th team in, in Halifax. And of course, that's uh, something that for many of us, that's been a dream now for, you know, for decades. The idea of this truly coast-to-coast -coast Canadian Football League. Now, the team itself may not be confirmed, but we do have a name, the Atlantic Schooners the winner of a Name the Team contest. But as Kayla Hounsell tells us, name or no name, the team still doesn't have a place to play. CFL Commissioner Randy Ambrosi has visited Halifax twice now, touting the benefits of a professional football team for Atlantic Canada. In addition to making the league truly Canadian with teams coast to coast, he says the addition of a 10th team would even the playing field and make for a more natural playoff setup. I think it is the unfinished piece of business that has, um, you know, has been on the, the hearts and minds of Canadian football fans uh, for, you know, for decades. A potential ownership group has come forward, which includes former co-owners of the NHL's Arizona Coyotes. They've launched a Name the Team contest and a season ticket drive. But building excitement is easy. Building a stadium, not so much. The biggest elephant in the room is a place to play. The CFL has been clear. Without a stadium, there will be no team. The group hasn't secured the funding or commitment to build one, but it has identified Shannon Park, a former military housing complex, as the preferred site. The group also says it will bring money to the table, though the up to $190 million project would require government support. I think we could use things better than, than, than that. I think it would invigorate the city, make it more interesting. I guess I'm skeptical, so I mean they've talked about it years and years and years and it hasn't happened yet, so. It's true, there has been buzz and excitement about a CFL team in Halifax numerous times, dating back to the early 80s when the Atlantic Schooners were announced. We've even seen plans for a stadium, but never a touchdown. I think this time you really can expect that th there is going to be a team. This sports economist has some concerns with the proposal we'll, itself, we'll but he says this time is different. The state of the CFL has never been stronger. Uh, you have an ownership group that's based out of Atlantic Canada with deep ties and a commitment to the, the region and the city in general. Uh, it, it's the right time. While there remain many questions as to how they'll do it, the potential owners say they're aiming to put a team on the field by 2021. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News. Halifax. Still ahead, one more story to get you ready for Sunday's big game. Meet the record-breaking Ottawa kicker who spent last year's Grey Cup on the sidelines as a security guard. His moment is our moment. And an update on the major manhunt for that feisty otter that's been dining out on koi fish in Vancouver. It's a story that's gripped the city and divided it. Which one are you guys? I'm pro koi. A pro otter. Ooh. So we have to figure it yeah. out later. Yeah. But yeah, I'm pro otter. I got a whole crew I'm recruiting for the pro otter campaign. For days, a search has been underway for an elusive critter. The hunt for this river otter has captured Vancouver and divided the city. As Renee Filipponi shows us, there are just two options. You're either Team Otter or Team Koi. To say things are out of control is an understatement. The normally idyllic Chinese garden in Vancouver is now a crime scene. And the suspect is not just eating koi, but playing koi. 
Uh, we did set a trap. Uh, the otter did visit our trap and uh, it took our fish and our tuna and our chicken. The river otter has made a home here. The picky eater seemingly only enjoying parts of the prized fish. It has decimated the population. They're super cute, but they've got vicious little teeth. And as you can see, the damage they've done to these fish. But I went in the other day and I was like, where are all the fish? In the predator versus prey debate, people are taking sides. At this local cafe, the concern for the fish is real. This news is going to get around in like right. otter well, circles. Otters, yeah. Maybe not, but it's sure making news. Hashtag OtterWatch2018 is trending on Twitter, and a parody otter account has a thousand plus followers. Fish to the otter, I guess. That's <laughs> people are even coming here, despite the garden being closed, just hoping for a glimpse. Ideally, I'd like to see him like burst through the water, flop through the air, and smash down Free Willy style. <laughs> Everyone has an opinion. It makes me feel sad because I have koi fish at home. I'm pro koi. I'm pro otter. So we have to duke it out later. A week ago, it was spotted crossing a street. Why it came and how it found the fish is still a mystery. By either maybe smelling the pond, maybe smelling the fish, or maybe it was just a random event. It was passing through that area. The city has set another trap, but this expert says if the otter is caught, a road trip will be its next adventure. They'll keep coming back, often as a group, not just singly, till there's no food left. And they don't want it back, because already it's running up a huge dinner bill. Koi aren't cheap. They were 1000 to $5,000, depending. So buttons are being sold now to raise funds to buy new fish. But you will have to pick sides. In the case of Grand Theft Otter. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Still ahead on The National, another story of man versus beast. We go off the B.C. coast where fishermen are fighting off an overwhelming number of seals and sea lions for their catch. Plus the latest installment in the Rocky series hitting theaters tonight. Victor Drago, son of Ivan Drago, who infamously killed Apollo Creed, appeared today to issue a challenge to Adonis Creed. Don't do this. I ain't got a choice. A lot of familiar names there. Will it pull in the crowds? The pop panel joins me to talk remakes, revivals, and reboots next. But first, seven months after they were both paralyzed in that devastating bus crash, humbled Broncos teammates Ryan Strishnitsky and Jacob Wasserman reunite for the first time on the ice. The two men have turned to sledge hockey to keep their on-ice dreams alive and they practiced together this morning ahead of an exhibition game at the University of Denver. They look good out there together, right? It's all right, you know, some of those guys out there are like really freaking good. And uh, being out with Straz was amazing. Haven't been on the ice with him in a long time, so that was a really good feeling. I think it was pretty cool. I got to see how each other uh, do on the ice and, you know, it was fun. It's the first time they've been on the ice since April 5th, so those two have been non-stop smiling since uh, we got on the plane yesterday, so it's been fantastic. He's he's found a way to, again, make the best out of the, a bad situation, and he's trying to enjoy life as an 18-year-old kid and, you know, hanging out with his buddies and getting back on the ice. And Even as a dad, it's in, inspirational to me to watch what not just Jacob, but, you know, all these guys are doing with moving on with their lives after what has happened to them. So. It's a grind, but, I mean, it's worth it getting results and it's paying off. Like, I, I'm, I'm excited to see where I can take it, see if I can. I'll, obviously, goal is to try and walk again, but that's, I mean, I'll, it is way, way down the road, if at all possible. So, it's doing my best. One of Hollywood's most hotly anticipated movies is finally here. That would be Creed II, the sequel to the revival of the Rocky movies from the 70s and 80s. I have a confession to make. I've never seen any of the Rocky movies. Reboots and remakes are such a huge part of pop culture. I'm Stephen Marsh, random Toronto writer. I'm Ashani Nath, senior editor at Flare.com. I'm Donovan Bennett, host and writer for Sportsnet. It's as if mainstream Hollywood has stopped thinking of new ideas. It's like resuscitating and remaking old films and old shows is all they want to do. And usually, 
they suck, but Creed appears to be in a class of its own, breaking box office records and earning critical acclaim. There are good ways and bad ways to do a reboot, but I think what Creed shows is actually that the way to do it is to go as far from the original as possible, because that way you're almost thinking for yourself. Well, welcome to the POP panel. It's nice to be back in Toronto for the first time in a month and uh, talk to the three of you. And let's begin with Creed Two. You are the only member of this panel who's seen it. You, you had an early viewing and you got to interview the star, Michael B. Jordan. I did, yeah. Um, I liked it. I thought it was good. That's what I wrote in my review. It made me feel, I guess, bad about myself because he in the movie has muscles that I didn't know exist. That's <laughs> why so I'm wearing a vest to kind of cover up why my core doesn't look like his. It's all CGI, man. Yeah, well, I hope so. <laughs> but I think it did a good job of acknowledging and flicking to the past and the iconic characters that we feel nostalgic about, but also framing it in a modern day context. The star is a leading man of this age and he's macho, but he's empathetical. His leading woman is someone with agency and as a partner, not just a spouse. The fighting sequences are not just Eye of the Tiger, which is, you know, old hat for us. It's cut to hip hop music. So they did a good job of respecting the legacy of the movie, but bringing it to 2018. One of the reasons we're talking about this movie is you may have the same experience I do. I, I saw it in 1976, the original Rocky movie, and thought, yeah, pretty good underdog story. Never couldn't even have guessed that so many years later we'd still be talking about this franchise and these themes and we're going to talk more about that in a second but let's look at a little bit of the trailer from Creed 2. It's time kid. So you got to ask yourself what were you really fighting for? I don't want you making the same mistakes I made. Okay, we all want to go for either a run or to the weight room <laughs> yeah. or whatever it is. Uh, Stephen, I, th I think one of the enduring parts of this movie franchise may be that boxing is made for Hollywood. Well, I mean, I think you have to kind of... I'm the cynic of this group, I think, and I think to me all these things are made as business decisions, right? And if you're going to make a boxing movie today, you basically have to make it a Rocky reboot because no one's going to see an original movie. People... You know, people only have access to things that they remember from, from the time when there was mass culture, which was the 70s, 80s. Um, you know, now we live in a niche culture where things are made for much smaller audiences. So to get that broader audience, you basically have to go back to the past in some way. And that's why, you know, when you actually look at what constitutes pop culture today, it's mostly things that were invented from the 60s to the 80s. There's some disagreement about what word we use to describe this movie. Is it a reboot? Is it a sequel? So whatever terminology you want, th that idea of taking an old franchise and, and continuing it or making it new, what's your feeling about that? So listen, I have no time for the exact same movie told the exact same way. And I think that's where re reboots often fail. What I think Creed and some other movies are doing that works is reimagining or reinventing stories or carrying on a story in a way that targets a new demographic or brings new demographics into the story. So I know, like, for example, Ocean's 8 wasn't the best movie ever, but it gave a chance for women to see themselves in these roles and in a franchise that they previously weren't part of. And I think there's power to that. How did you feel about Ocean's I just, 8? It's my least favorite thing when they do this, when they did it with Ghostbusters and they did it with Ocean. Like, make a female-centered heist movie like they did with... Uh, Widows. With Widows. Yep. This is way better than taking some born-out franchise and then putting in the, uh, you know, exact demographic or more the, virtue, pol the political virtue that you want to see reflected into these things it's so lazy to me and it's almost always leads to bad movies i mean i don't think it has to be either or though and i think that's where a lot of the conversation gets stuck is it doesn't have to be oceans 8 or widows i think oceans 8 helped open that door start conversations that are now leading to widows and more movies like <laughs> it that. started a conversation about why is this movie so bad i mean that's, that's the conversations that started but there's still <laughs> young women who are going to look up to that movie and say oh that's really cool i can be a lead i can see myself in these types of films. Last word on this topic, Donovan? Yeah, I mean, think whether it's requills or, or <laughs> spin-offs. <laughs> requills, I like Branding yeah. exercises is more closer to what it is. Sure, but, but I think it, the situation matters. So maybe Lion King telling it again, exactly the same, but with new technology would work. But bringing back Boomerang, uh, today, with, with some of the with new characters, may not work, right? So I think certainly the situation uh, matters, but with Rocky, uh, 
it does work. Right? It, it does work because yeah. they've respected some of the things in this era that wouldn't play as well. Any chance you're going to watch? Oh, I think I'll see it for sure. And you? Maybe. Maybe. All right. Okay. So <laughs> uh, we didn't set out today to talk only about movies, but it's the way it's going to work out because there is a phenomenon happening right now on both Canadian and American television that is related to both movies and Christmas. We're going to talk about it in a sec, but take a look at this. Candace Cameron Bure stars in one of the 12 new original movies of Christmas. Have you ever seen it, Snow? No. Winter Wonderlands weren't her thing. I do not do winter. Did you two get off on the wrong foot? I don't think she has the right foot. Until a little Christmas spirit melted her heart. I just never imagined there could be so much magic in Christmas. Let it snow. Okay, stay with us. I worry that there's somebody who's been flipping around the channels and <laughs> ended up seeing that and thinking, oh, something horribly wrong just right. happened uh, on the national. So the reason we're showing that is that the Hallmark Company has made a series of movies that have appeared on the, I think it's a Hallmark channel in the United States. The W Network here is playing, uh, I don't know, 22 of them, one almost every night. Uh, you've seen some of them? I've seen one or two How of the Hallmark How would you describe ones. them to the audience? They are exactly the same every time. I like to compare it to like the Christmas dinner, you know exactly what you're going to get. There's going to be turkey, there's going to be stuffing, there's going to be mashed potatoes. Um, you know what you're getting, there's a sense of comfort in that, but not much changes movie to movie. Yeah, but you've watched some, Would you, will you watch more? Because apparently there's one a night. So, you know what, I do, I find that this year, more than previous years, I am taking comfort in those very predictable narratives. Um, I think there was a, st a study done in the U.S. where it showed that there's people take comfort in knowing exactly what's going to happen. That's why we watch reruns. Mm -hmm. So for example, that's why Friends is on all the time, yeah. Seinfeld. And I think that same idea can be applied here. So somebody in my house who shall remain nameless has been watching these and I began by mocking them, but, but I have to say that after a while, there is some weird, strange comfort in uh, having them on. Also spotting the Canadian cities where many of them are shot. Um, I'm a little afraid to ask you this question. Hey. Stephen, how do you feel about it? No, no, no. Whatever gets you the through the Hallmark night. Hallmark phenomenon. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's 2018. It's dark outside. It's cold. You're in Canada around Christmas. Like, you should just watch whatever is going to make you feel okay. And whatever's going to make you feel like the world is going to turn out all right. That's what, I mean, that's what Christmas is about. Even, even for people who aren't religious like me, it's like, you know, things are going to be okay. So, yeah, there should, of course there should be these movies. You described yourself earlier on uh, in this edition of the panel as, as the cynic uh, mm. on the panel, but that turns out that it's not true because this guy is when it comes to Christmas movies. <laughs> He's right. more angry. Your view of the uh, Hallmark phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, they're not for me. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but they're not for me. And, and I think your analogy of comfort food is a great one because if, if we're going to talk about turkey, yeah, yeah, we have it around Christmas, but it's, it's not the best meat. It's, it's not even the best bird. Can you eat it every night? You no, definitely of course not. Oh, that's a good point. Right? Yeah. So these movies make you, I suppose, feel nostalgic, makes you feel like, oh, it's Christmas time, which people like, but they're not good. No. Uh, for me, I don't see myself in them. I don't see a lot of diversity in them. They're certainly aspirational as to what we're supposed to aspire to. I've never landed in a small town in a helicopter either. No, yeah, so, right? neither have I, know. neither have I, funny enough. But they're, they're, they're very... Caucasian, yeah, very Anglo Saxon. Sure they yeah. They're very heteronormative, yeah. and we are not really uh, that way as a country all of the time. And I would love to see more diversity in them, but I get why there isn't because it is a formula. There's an audience there, and so they're feeding to that audience. But there's no reason why that formula couldn't be broadened, right? Like yeah. you could take the the comfort part of that, and uh, you know maybe. Like, even the Christmas dinner isn't always turkey for every single family. There's definitely space to push, push these stories a little bit further, and I think you can apply the same narrative. You can still have those same staples with different types of people. Like, I don't think I've ever seen my, myself reflected in a Christmas movie or a Hallmark movie. I still find comfort in them. Um, but yeah, there, there is room for change for sure. We have 30 <laughs> seconds each to hear from our panelists on either your recommendation for a must-see Christmas movie for someone or what your favorite Christmas movie is. Uh, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so one of the movies that I consistently love is The Holiday. Um, this is Kate Winslet, uh, Jack Black, Cameron Diaz, and Jude Law. And I love it because it has all of those same tropes, but mm -hmm. it's not quite as cheesy, it's not quite as predictable, but it still feels really cozy and comfortable and 
just great. I've seen it. It's very watchable. Donovan, is the, do you even have one? I mean, no. <laughs> uh, like, if I had to choose, it would be Die Hard because it's the farthest thing from an actual <laughs> Christmas movie that exists. So I'm actually going to use my time to say don't watch Love Actually. I was forced to watch it, and I call it Hate Actually because I hate it. See, I, okay, I will explain why he's doing that in just a moment. Stephen? Well, it's a wonderful life. I think it kind of gets siloed off into this group with Christmas movies. It is one of the great American films. It's one of the greatest American films ever made. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's underrated. I think because it's a Christmas movie, it kind of gets underrated. Um, if you watch it and just try to experience it, it's such a great film. The reason Donovan mentioned Love Actually is for better or worse, uh, it's a movie that I love and I watch two or three times every Christmas. And I was just going to mention it at the end and then just fade to black <laughs> so no one could, uh, could dig in. But we have 30 seconds. Uh, can you in 15 seconds say why I'm wrong about Love Actually? Uh, it is a film that has no connection with anything about love in it. Like Actually. every version of love in it is actually something that isn't love at all. And it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's so shallow and so cheap, and but it's not even sentimental. It has no human warmth. <laughs> you, mean it's like, you mean stealing your, your best friend's fiance is not love? Or just if you fall in love, if you fall in love with a woman who doesn't speak your language and brings you drinks in the afternoon, that's not love. So let's go to camera three here, and let me just say we will continue this conversation after, but uh, let's just end the TV portion of the pop panel now. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Next on The National, sharing the hall. This is what's happening for the last few years now. They just come when they're fishing and they're here the whole time. It's just like pigs at a trough in a farm, I guess. Greg Rasmussen takes us out on a boat off the coast of BC where fishermen are battling seals and sea lions for their share of the catch. But first, a quick look at a conversation we have for you Sunday night on The National. Two years ago, Michael Buble dropped everything, put his career on hold after his three-year-old son Noah was diagnosed with cancer. On Sunday night, Buble opens up about his family's journey with the host of CBC Radio 1's Q, Tom Power. Here's a preview. Just because I wonder around the places we would go. I think I realized that a lot of the things I had worried about, a lot of the things that I thought mattered, just are not important. And I think, um, you know, I really wanted to experience the positive things in life and the beautiful things because I, I got a sense of mortality. I got a sense of um, the, truly the things that are important in life. And um, for me, every single moment started to matter and being in the moment started to matter. And Michael, is that, is that change an immediate Change for or, me, it was, or is that something that you have to uh, work no, on? Tom, for me, it was like um... when I fall in love. Uh, it sounds like that uh, there was an attack in an apartment. And it led to some good neighbors hearing the uh, hearing what was going on, calling 911. We're following developments in a shocking assault in Toronto tonight, leaving a teenage girl and a mother with serious injuries. It happened inside a residential building in Scarborough. A 17-year-old girl was found with stab wounds to her upper body. She is in life-threatening condition. The mother, believed to be in her 30s, also in hospital. She has a head injury. Police are now looking for a man who was running from the scene. An update now to a CBC investigation we brought you last night of secret recordings from staff of a foster care agency in Manitoba. They revealed the agency had dragged its heels when sexual abuse allegations arose in one of its homes. The government was criticized over that in the legislature today, and the premier was asked whether he'll order an investigation into how the allegations were handled. We'll have, to, we'll have to be open to the possibility, but I think in the meantime, we have to respect the agency's roles and responsibilities. There is a review underway, but it's being done by Métis Child and Family Services, which oversees the agency involved, and it's under no obligation to share those findings with the public. Ottawa Senator's owner Eugene Melnick is suing his business partners for a whopping $700 million. It is a major redevelopment project in Ottawa that planned to include a new arena for the hockey team. 
The lawsuit claims Melnick's partners went behind his back and started developing another property that would be in direct competition. That project would be Ottawa's tallest high-rise. The partners are denying the claims. Well, seals and sea lions might look cute, but there's a fierce debate over them on the West Coast. Their populations have exploded since hunting was banned in the 70s, while at the same time, salmon stocks have plummeted. Scientists are divided over whether seals and sea lions are to blame for that and whether hunting will help the fishery recover. Our Greg Rasmussen went to the Salish Sea to find out. The fog is thick as the 24-meter-long Western investor heads out to sea. The crew prepares for the difficult, sometimes dangerous work of the herring fishery and the promise of a battle ahead. You can hear all the sea lions. They've been following us for the past hour. The sea lions have learned there's an easy meal to be had when they see the boat. They're paying out the net, basically, and they're circling around the school of herring that's underneath us. Tom Seawit is a longtime commercial fisherman and part of the Kwakwakawak First Nation. So the way this network is, they, they put it out in a wall and then they close the bottom, right? Close the bottom, purse yeah. up the rings, shut yeah. the bottom down. Right now the net's like that. Soon the battle between human and sea lion begins. This is what's happening for the last few years now. They just come when they're fishing and they're here the whole time. It's just like pigs at a trough in a farm, I guess. They're habituated themselves to see humans and fishing equates easy access to food, you know, which is, you know, it's not right. It's, it's the animal kingdom is not supposed to be like that. The seals and sea lions aren't just a nuisance. This type of feeding frenzy is also hitting salmon stocks. Salmon are the main food source for BC's southern resident killer whales. Without them, the whales starve. Some scientists say drastically culling the seal and sea lion populations would help. The thing that will really benefit the southern resident killer whales is to see improved survival of, Chinook, of small Chinook salmon, and I think the only way we can achieve that is by reducing seal numbers. What scientists should do when we see a situation like this is we should advocate an experiment to see who's right. Although a commercial harvest of seals and sea lions is illegal, Seawood was able to hunt under laws allowing First Nations to harvest for ceremonial and food purposes. He hopes to expand it. But not all scientists agree it would help. They argue taking out predators doesn't necessarily save the prey. It's just getting worse every year. Tom Seawood admits a renewed commercial hunt would be bloody and he expects fierce confrontations with animal rights groups. But it's a fight he believes in. We have to wake up. You know, all the indicators are there. These animals aren't afraid of humans. It's time for us to get the balance back. For now, sea lions and the fishing crew continue to share the haul. The animals unaware they may soon be in the hunter's crosshairs. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, aboard the Western Investor in the Salish Sea. Next on the National, from the sidelines to the middle of the big game. I still have to pinch myself to think that, you know, this is this is kind of really happening. Meet the security guard turned record-breaking kicker who's playing for the Grey Cup this weekend in our moment. But first. In case you missed it, global fashion brand Dolce & Gabbana is struggling to counter a backlash after its campaign aimed at China's luxury market. It has been scorned as tone-deaf, even racist. Two videos show a woman in outdated Chinese dress struggling to eat Italian food using chopsticks. Instead of enticing China's wealthy, it could cost the company a fortune in lost business. On Wednesday, it cancelled a major live event in Shanghai, hours before it was set to begin, after Chinese models and celebrities dropped out. One of them wrote, you don't love China, you love money. Things got worse when an Instagram chat came to light that seemed to show Stefano Gabbana making derogatory remarks about Chinese people. Gabbana said his account had been hacked, but the anger only grew. Al Dolce and Gabbana products disappeared from store shelves and perhaps more crucially from the online retail giants such as Alibaba. China represents more than one-third of the world market for luxury goods. Today, the designers apologize. That may not be enough.
You think foul play was involved? Van Zandt has enemies. I'll keep my wits about me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Frankie Drake Mysteries, season finale, Monday on CBC. The 106th Great Cup is this Sunday. And for 26-year-old Lewis Ford, Ward, it is nothing short of a dream come true. One year ago, he was standing on the sidelines as a security guard. Fast forward a year and he's back, only this time he's kicking field goals for the Ottawa Red Blacks. Ward's journey to the Great Cup is our moment of the day. I start to pinch myself to think that, you know, this is, this is kind of really happening. Lewis played football at the University of Ottawa, but picked up a security gig at the Grey Cup to make a little extra cash. I was on the field, so I was actually very close to the action. Then from the sidelines to the CFL field. At the end of last season, the Red Blacks came knocking. I had that confidence that, that I was going to be successful. I consider myself a calm, cool, calm and collective kind of guy. Um, I try not to let things phase me, but it really comes from your preparation. His rookie season, nothing short of sensational. He's been smashing records. That field goal, his 45th in a row, breaking the record for pro football. And now he's got his eyes set on that coveted cup. I have the expectation in myself that, uh, um, you know, that I, that I should make every kick. I feel the coaches put me in a position that, um, you know, nothing that I can't handle. I don't think you have to be a, a kicker to appreciate what this guy can do, despite the conditions, despite the temperature despite the what's going on in the game uh, look at these numbers the rookie record in the cfl was 22 field goals in a row he smashed that the record in the cfl is 33 and as you heard the pro football record is 45 field goals in a row i think he ended up with 51 out of 52 attempts and so one more reason to watch the great cup you can maybe pvr the national the michael buble interview and all of that uh and let's hope for another perfect night for Ottawa's kicker. That is a national for Friday, November 23rd. Good night.